All right, guys, today we're going to be in Exodus 15. And uh, before we jump into that, I want to make sure that we have kind of the over arc of where we've been in our minds. It's going to be kind of like drinking from a fire hose for the next couple minutes. Promise you we'll get through it, okay? So the story of Exodus kind of hones in on a guy named Moses. Uh, he, when he was a baby, uh, Pharaoh, in kind of a genocidal rage, wanted to extinguish God's people. And he commanded that all the baby boys of the Hebrews get thrown into the river to drown. Well, God actually miraculously saves him through uh, Pharaoh's own daughter. And Moses actually grows up in Pharaoh's own household. And one day as he's grown up, he goes out and he sees the plight of his people who are enslaved, abused, oppressed. They have no rights. Their only value is whatever they can produce. And it inflames his sense of justice. He's so angry. He has the right motivation. He wants God's people to be free but it comes out in the wrong method. And he actually kills the slave master in his rage, tries to bury it and uh, bury the sin, hide it. And um, he, he, his sin actually gets found out. And in terror, he runs from his sin to a land called Midian, lives there for 40 years, trying to start a whole new life over. Marries, has kids. He takes care of his father-in-law's flocks. And one day, his, uh, God came to him. In the, in the form of a burning bush and said, Moses, I'm sending you right back into the lap of the land of one of your greatest failures. And I'm going to use you in mighty ways. And uh, after some arguing between Moses and God, Moses eventually decides he's going to obey God. And he and his brother Aaron go back to Egypt and they, they gather the elders of Israel and tell them that God has heard their cry, that God is going to bring a great salvation and freedom from their slavery. And the Israelites worship together with Moses and Aaron. It looks like everything's up and to the right until Moses and Aaron go toe to toe with Pharaoh. And it kind of begins a cycle where Moses and Aaron say, God says, let his people go. Pharaoh says, "Uh uh-uh, not doing it, bro. And then God sends a plague of judgment over Egypt, just decimating this global superpower. And then Pharaoh says, okay, okay, I relent. And then the plague stops and things go back to some semblance of normalcy and Pharaoh changes his mind. This cycle goes through 10 times over, decimating Egypt because of Pharaoh's pride and hardness of heart. He would not submit to God. And eventually it culminates in the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn. And now not only is Egypt decimated, Pharaoh is a broken man, a man who's lost his own child among a people who have lost their children. And in his brokenness, uh, he, he says, fine, get out of here. And he implores the Israelites to leave. And they leave with some choice valuables from the Egyptians. And the Israelites are leaving everything they've ever known. Yes, it's slavery. Yes, it's oppression. Yes, it's abuse. But it's all they've ever known. You were born a slave. You lived as a slave. You died as a slave. Slavery was your heritage. Mom's a slave. Dad's a slave. Grandparents are slaves. This is centuries of oppression and slavery. And now they're free, but that's all they know. And they're following this kind of mysterious guy named Moses who did some crazy cool things by the power of God. And he leads them into what looks like a trap. The sea on one side Three million people can't cross over it. And guess what? Pharaoh has changed his mind and he sent his army after these former slaves. He wants to kill them. So they're stuck in an impossible situation between death and death. And three million people, like if I'm there in that moment, I'm gonna be like, Moses, quit playing with your stick over by the water. Let's get a plan together, bro. There's a big army coming for us. They got battle, uh, they're battle ready. They've got weapons of war. What are we gonna do? And God hears the cry of his people and tells Moses, raise your staff. And this impossible situation, this moment of there's no path forward, God wrought a beautiful redemption as the Red Sea splits in two, walls of water on both sides, dry ground in the middle. And and the three million Israelites walk through this newfound land bridge in the midst of this sea where it was just full of water. Now there's a path forward. God made a way in the impossible. And as they're going through behind them, 
The Egyptian army is coming after them still, entering into the seas. But as the Israelites end up on the other side of the shore, on the banks of the shore, they watch as this global superpower, its king and all, topples. As God causes the towering waters to crash down upon them. And Israel's watching from the banks on the other side of the shore. How do you process all of that? Like the, the abuse and oppression of slavery, the, 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 the judgment of God against the Egyptians and the plagues and the decimation of this global superpower. How do, you, how do you process being put in an impossible situation where your children are looking to you, mommy, daddy, what do we do? How do you process this in, intense, miraculous moment in the ocean where God provides a way where there was no way? How do you process as you're standing on the bank of the shoreline? And I thought this was so interesting from last week. They're standing on the bank of the shoreline, watching as the bodies of their oppressors wash it on the shore. How do you process all of that? Here's what Israel does. Exodus 15 verse 1. Then Moses and the people sang this song to the Lord saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. As a heart's response to what God has just done, they just bust out in spontaneous worship. Right? They say the horse and his rider has been thrown into the sea. The agent and instrument of war are done away with. Right? This is a, an immediate response. This wasn't planned. They weren't like, okay, hey, let's get together at this time. It, it was a spontaneous response to the redemption of God that they had just witnessed. They're processing that God just toppled their oppressors. This mighty nation has been destroyed. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. A declaration of this is my God. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. That the, the word there for Lord is the, is the name that God gave to Moses way back at the beginning of the story when Moses is saying, okay, God, if I go back to Israel and Egypt and tell them, let my people go, who should I say sent me? Right? I don't want them to kill the messenger in the process. Who should I say sent me? Yahweh. It's the same name that they're chanting, they're singing, they're praising right now. The Lord is his name. Look, they've been taught all kinds of false gods. Pharaoh himself probably set himself up as a god. And here they're saying, now we identify with Yahweh. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. This wasn't uh, the pipsqueak warriors. These were chosen officers. Can you hear how they're processing like what just happened? These are mighty warriors done away with. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. The vivid imagery of what they watched and, and these bodies going down and sinking into the depths of the sea. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Later on, uh, as they talk about this story, they continually talk about God's right hand or his mighty hand by which he brought Israel out of bondage, out of slavery in Egypt. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. I love that. They, this is really, they, Egypt is Israel's adversary, but God has so identified himself with his people. They say, in the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries, God. You send out your fury, it consumes them like stubble. Can you hear the processing? Like, the Israelites know the power of Egypt. They've lived under the regime of Egypt for centuries. And now they've watched as this nation, it says here, is consumed like stubble. There's nothing left of it. 
Verse 8, at the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. I love that verse. It sounds pretty silly on the, on the surface. When I first read this, as I was preparing, I was like, just, I got this image of like a giant cosmic nose coming down and sneezing on the Egyptians and the Egyptians just died. But that's not the, the, the context behind the word here. The word for nostrils is af. It's an af sound. And it means like the anger of the Lord right? Af is, is, is when somebody's angry and their nostrils flare and they're breathing heavily. The face of the anger of the Lord was against the Egyptians. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up, the floods stood in a heap, the deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. And now listen to the heart and the motivations. They're going to talk about their enemy, the Egyptians. Listen to the heart and the motivations of the Egyptians. It seems these are common sentiments that the Israelites were very familiar with. Listen to this. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. I will get what I want from you. You are nothing to me. This is a refrain they've heard for their whole life. They don't have value. They don't have rights. Their only value is what, they can, what the Egyptians can get from them. I will, I will, my desire will be filled. That's their motivations as they're pursuing them into the Red Sea. Verse 10, but you blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. They, they're, they're forming their theology. They're forming their beliefs about God. Remember, the, the Israelites didn't have this. They didn't have the Bible. They had some oral tra traditions. They maybe had some songs of remembrance about who God was. They would have had oral traditions probably from creation and Abraham's story and Joseph's story and maybe a few others, but they're following a God who's mostly mystery to them. And they've just seen him do an impossible thing. And they're saying, we've heard about all the Egyptian gods. We've seen Pharaoh who sets himself up to be God. No one is like you. Glorious, majestic, awesome in power, doing wonders. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. Verse 13, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. They're looking at this great act of judgment against Egypt and they see it as an expression of God's love. And on the surface, as I was studying this, I was like, man, there's a pretty visceral image. They're standing on the shorelines with their kids at their ankles saying, yes, these bodies that are washing up and the bodies that are sinking into the deeps of the sea and the death of the Egyptian army is an act of love on behalf of, uh, on behalf of God towards us. How is that so? God's justice served his love. Remember the plight of the Israelites. They had no rights. They were in bondage. They were slaves. They had no value. It's like when, when a little child is redeemed from trafficking or just of an abusive situation, you want to make sure that they will never enter that again. And this great act of divine justice rightly exacted against the Egyptians is also an expression of God's love for his people whom he has redeemed. You have led in your steadfast love the people you have redeemed. You have guided them, verse 13, by your strength to your holy abode. Now they've been examining and processing and just worshiping this, this moment of God, right? This went from a crazy, like everybody get to the other side, action-packed movie like Rambo. And then on the other side of the sea, it turns into high school musical. They're just dancing and singing everywhere. I don't think they dance like that, but, but it just changes, it shifts. And they've been praising God for what he's done and what he's done is now going to give them faith for what he will do. Look at this. Verse 14, the peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone. 
They're saying, look, God, we have other enemies out there, right? And, and we're a nobody people. They're not afraid of us. We're former slaves. We're weak. We're not trained in battle. We don't have weapons of war, but they are terrified of our God. You know, fl- fight, flight, or freeze. They're frozen. It says they're still as a stone, terrified of the judgment that God just brought upon the Egyptians, this global superpower. And this, is, this has been God's aim throughout the whole book of Exodus. He wants to be known. He wants to reveal himself to his people. He wants to reveal himself to the Egyptians and to the world. He wants to be known. The people have heard and they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. The Canaanites are terrified. This, these are established people, groups, and nations. And they're not looking at the Israelites as a threat. They're looking at their God as, oh no, he, he's pretty powerful. Look at what he's done. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone to your people, O Lord, pass by. To the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. As I was driving um, to work on Wednesday, I was listening to Exodus 15 and those words plant and establish in those last couple of verses just really stood out to me. What would that have meant to a people who don't have a land yet? who are just coming out of everything that they knew. They're not established. They're not planted. They're kind of wandering in the wilderness for a while. And, and their, their, their faith is welling up. God, you will do this. You will plant, you will establish us. The Lord will reign forever and ever, verse 18. And in the original language, I read some commentators on this. Um, they say that in the Hebrew, the, the emphasis is like, this is a refrain or a repetition or a chant that they would have kept singing. The Lord will reign forever and ever, ongoing refrain. And I love uh, where Moses goes next in the passage because he's recounted the story, right, in, le- in the last chapter. We heard that last week. Now they've sang about the story and now he's gonna tell us why they're singing. I think Moses doesn't want anybody confused about who did what in this story. He doesn't want them to think it's that Moses' great might or that the Israelites, three million of them, came up with some sort of awesome way to get through the sea. Listen to what he says. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. So this is an act of God. It's not my leadership. It wasn't the three million of us coming up with something cool together. God did this thing. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron. I think it's so interesting that Moses says the sister of Aaron because it's also his sister. I don't know if there was some sort of sibling spat going on at this moment, but the sister of Aaron is also Moses' sister. It's probably the sister, most commentators believe, that saw Moses get put in the water and saved by Pharaoh's daughter. But she's a prophetess. She's a woman who goes before the throngs of Israel and proclaims what God has to say to his people. And here, what is she doing? It says, and Miriam, uh, then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. So they're leading the charge in worship. They got the drums, the tambourines, they're dancing. This is, Moses was done with his part of the song, but Miriam's like, The party's not over yet. We're going to continue to praise and worship our God. And Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider, he has thrown into the sea. It's the same refrain, or the same part of the beginning of Moses' song. They're just astonished. They're amazed at the power of God against this powerful nation. And I really, I just want to pull out one thing today. Um, Each week during this series, we're trying to pull out one thing that reveals the character of God as he is revealing himself to his people. And these are very, very foundational and elementary uh, principles about who God is. And that's intentional because if we don't have a good foundation, anything we build upon it is just going to topple. So today, what I want to pull out is God is praiseworthy. God is praiseworthy. Throughout this passage, we see that the heart's response of these people is praising God for the great redemption he just brought about. 
there are so many places in the life of a follower of God that are vying for your praise, right? Think of that moment. Have you ever seen that video when the Beatles first came to America, that two minutes where like the whole crowd just goes nuts, right? Look like everybody's having a seizure together. They're all screaming and just freaking out, right? That's worship. That's praise. Or have you ever seen a fully grown man that you know to be in full control of his faculties, paint his body and go to a sporting event and just scream and yell at the ref? That can be praise. That can be worship. There's all kinds of places that are drawing our affections away from God. So the question is, who's on the throne of your heart? Who is it that you're giving praise to? Is it the Lord? He's the only one who's praiseworthy. Let's look at it again in the passage. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song. So this is a a response to what God has just done. And he says, I will sing to the Lord. So when I'm talking about praise and worship today, I'm not talking about living a life of sacrifice. I'm talking about an aspect of that, an aspect of worship and praise, which is singing to God, singing privately and communally to God as the Israelites did here in this story. And when I first started studying for this message, I thought, this is not the message for me. Like, I just don't resonate with worship music. I, I'm, I'm not a, uh, an expressive worshiper. It's not something that I just really, um, in my own private dis- uh, prayer life or, or private worship life or praise life or my communal life, it's just not a big aspect. But we had Jordan, the worship director from the Sutherland campus, come to the teaching team last week. We're creating a worship series for 2024. And he just unpacked his vision for worship and how he lives it privately and what it means communally with God's people. And I was honestly convicted. And I remembered earlier this year, I went to a concert in Portland. It was a hardcore band. I've been listening to them for 20 years and I was there and they're up on stage and I am here. Like I am in it. We're right by the mosh pit, but my wife wore sandals. So the whole time I had to like guard her from all the insane 30 year olds behind me that are flailing their bodies everywhere. So her toes don't get stepped on. But I was just so enamored. My heart is connected. Nostalgia is going on in my brain and I'm screaming the lyrics. I'm singing the lyrics. I'm there, right? That was Thursday night. Sunday morning, I went to church. And during worship, my heart was mostly disinterested. I, get, I, I, I was singing far more valuable, far more uh, beautiful truths Sunday morning. But my heart was mostly disinterested. And I'm not saying at all that a church service should look like a hardcore concert. Like, I don't think um, churches should have mosh pits, okay? Uh, Paul gives us some very clear guidelines in the book of Corinthians about, about orderly worship. But what I'm saying is my heart was disinterested on Sunday and fully engaged on Thursday. And I felt the conviction of God. Why? You're singing with your brothers and your sisters to your heavenly father. You're singing of the great truths of your salvation. Why were you so much more engaged on Thursday night? And so for you, I'd ask, what is your level of engagement? Where is your heart? I'm not talking about body expressions. In scripture, there's all kinds of expressions of worship. But where is your heart in the midst of worship? It can be easy to get distracted by what you have to do later or the worries, or, but coming together with God's people in communal worship can be a beautiful thing. So where is your heart? Are you giving God praise both privately in your own singing time to him and communally? And look at the content of this song. They're learning that God is praiseworthy. Look at this. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? This song has awesome and beautiful theology, right? That the, the God is majestic, that God is holy, that God is glorious. This is rich in good theology. And guess what? They didn't get their theology from a Bible class or a theology book. They didn't even get their theology from this because they didn't have this yet. They got this rich 
theology from a personal experience of a relationship from the God of the universe. And I want to be careful. I'm not saying that all of our experiences uh, uh, should form our theology. But God is not just a book. He's a person to be experienced. And here they have this grand experience of the power of God and it comes out with awesome theology. They say, God, you're holy. We just saw you destroy unholy, wicked Egyptians. You're holy. They ascribe that to him. You're glorious. You're far above everybody here. We just saw you topple the greatest power on earth in our day. And so as they experience God, they ascribe the truths of what their experience was in that moment. God showed up in a very visceral way. Remember, they didn't have the Holy Spirit to lead them and they didn't have the scriptures to guide them into theology. God is revealing himself in a very visceral way. And so Miriam, at the end of this, she, she comes up and she begins to, to lead. Moses is done and he kind of uh, lets her take the reins. And Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. You know, as, as I've wrestled and I am wrestling through this with you, I, I, I struggle with musical worship. It's not a place, like I said, that my heart always connects to. But I, I came to a realization, um, you know, over 400 times in the Bible, it talks about God's people singing or God singing over us. Jesus sang. Before he goes to the garden of Gethsemane, it says he and his disciples sang a hymn together. I think he was a man with a song in his heart. Did you know that we're also commanded over 50 times to sing? Look at it. Here's just this kind of a smattering of some, some verses, but Old and New Testament, where God's there, these, are in, these are moments where God's people are commanded to worship, to praise, or to sing. We have the Psalms, which is a book of poetry and songs uh, to God. And, I, and as I read that, I, I thought, that's weird, right? Like we're commanded to sing, like don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't covet, oh, and sing to me. Don't take the Lord's name in vain and sing to me. Like I thought, that's strange. But I've come to understand that musical worship, both private and communal, is an essential part of our spiritual formation. Because here, one of the reasons is because music speaks to the heart in a way mere words cannot. Like you can hear a great gospel presentation message and hear a gospel song and it will affect your heart differently. Music speaks to our hearts in a way that mere words cannot. And so so music is an essential aspect of our spiritual formation. And so I wanted to pull one of these verses out as we're crossing the bridge, right? The Israelites worship because of the great salvation God brought them, but God's not parting the Red Sea for us. So what does this mean for us today? I wanted to cross the bridge by looking at Colossians 3.16. It says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. We're going to ask how several times throughout this. So how do we let the message of Christ dwell among us richly? As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. If we just stop right there, here's where my mind goes. All right, we need to get a great Bible teacher. We need to have some Bible studies. We need to get into the Greek and the Hebrew. We need to dig in and get nitty gritty and nerdy with the Bible, right? That's not what it says. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through what? Psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. How do we let the message of Christ dwell among us richly? Singing. Singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Now, I'm not trying to belittle the importance of a message I've given my life to teaching. I think it's important. But this verse says, if we want this to dwell among us richly, and by the way, this is in the flow of a passage about how to live the Christian life well. And when he says among you, this is a communal thing that they're talking about. Singing to God together. This is an essential part of our spiritual formation. Is it in your spiritual formation? In your discipleship, do you have space for private and communal worship? In, in your raising of your family, your children, 
Do you, do you bring forth these psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit singing to God together? This is not a, a uh, it's not, I used to think of, of, of worship music as kind of the, the preamble or, or the preparation for the real gospel proclamation, but it's not. Worship is gospel proclamation and it's crucial and it's vital for our spiritual formation. So is it a part of your discipleship? You see, it's vital because we have a far greater redemption than the Red Sea moment. Now, I'm not belittling what God did here. It's awesome. It's amazing. I hope heaven has replays, okay? I want to see that. But on the other side of the Red Sea, the Israelites didn't have the redemption that you and I have, freedom from the penalty, power, and presence of sin. They didn't have that. They were redeemed from their great oppressor, but they still had to wrestle against sin. They still had to fight against the power of sin over their lives. We've been released from the power of sin. They, they, still, didn't, they, they still had to offer sacrifices because of the penalty of sin. We've been forgiven from the penalty of sin. We have a far greater redemption from the, than the Red Sea moment. We, we have a far greater redemption than God splitting the waters. He split the temple curtain in two saying, come to me. And so here in a moment at all of our campuses, we're going to have the worship team come up. And I want to challenge you as we close in worship, whatever your posture in worship has been, whatever your heart's posture rather, take a step towards God in this moment. God himself came down in the person and work of Jesus, his perfect life, that he never sinned. We, we mess up in, on that all the time, whether in thought, word, or deed, every day. Jesus never did. And then in his death, his, uh, on the cross, he who knew no sin, this is my, one of my favorite Bible verses, he who knew no sin became sin for us, for you and I, that we might become the righteousness of God. The great exchange. He died in our place, taking the wrath we rightly deserve, but he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose in a powerful resurrection, confirming who he said he was, conquering our greatest enemy, sin. The only thing that separates us from God, sin. Conquering a real spiritual enemy, Satan. And conquering the grave itself. He's overcome death. And it's in his life, death, and resurrection that you and I have redemption. That's great and beautiful. As we've repented and placed our faith in him, it's far greater than the Red Sea moment. I just want to challenge you in, in your homes, wherever, whatever space you're in right now, to, to take a small step in your journey of praising and worshiping God, both privately and communally. If, if you have the ability to, and you haven't been to a campus in a while or a local congregation, I highly encourage you. Go join your brothers and sisters. There is something that is beautiful that can happen as, as you join with them in the praise of your God and the gospel redemption that you've received. But maybe you're not in a space where you're actually able to, to come to the, to the campus or a local congregation. I, I just encourage you, we have praise and worship music at the front end of uh, every sermon at Family Church. And then we also have on our YouTube channel, we have a bank of just some worship videos. Go there and maybe bring some of your family into a moment together in your home where you can communally praise the God who redeemed you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your redemption. Thank you for uh, just the truth of the gospel that you, uh, you've given us a redemption that's greater than anything. It, you've saved us from the penalty, power, and ultimately the presence of sin. And God, I just pray as we endeavor to reflect your glory back to you in praise and worship that you would you'd meet us where we're at and that we would be blessed as we privately and communally worship. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. And now the God who loves you says, go and make disciples. Have a good Sunday.